Colleagues, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on uh, third reading of Bill S3. I want to again thank uh, the chairmanship of uh, Senator Massacott and in fact the whole committee uh, for their thoughtful deliberation at committee and within chamber at second reading. Um, the 2014 bill, I also, sorry, want to thank Senator Ravalia for shepherding uh, this through. It's an important bill, as you know, I've spoken on it many times, uh, both in chamber and outside. Uh, the 2014 bill was simply enabling legislation for regulations to be written. Uh, we don't make the regulations in Senate. They don't make the regulations in the other place. We simply enable uh, officials and the government to create the regulations, and that is done through a process of consultation and gazetting. I'll speak about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, in the initial legislation, colleagues, you'll recall there was five years given. That was extended to one year, extended by one year in the 2018 budget, second budget implementation act. Uh, S3 grants or attempts to grant uh, two additional years to that uh, to that program uh, to uh, to December 31st, 2022. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's it's. It's coincidental to be addressing this at this time. Uh, yesterday, all of Newfoundland and Labrador quite publicly commemorated the 39th anniversary of the sinking of the Ocean Ranger and the loss of 84 lives. Um, and very soon in early March, we'll be uh, remembering the Cougar Flight 491 where 17 people lost their lives. This is, this is important for not just Newfoundland and Labrador, not just for the workers in the offshore, but for all of Canada. And it should be it should be commemorated uh, in that light. Uh, at committee, we heard from the operators. The operators are the large companies that operate in the offshore. Companies like Exxon Mobil, uh, Husky, uh, Suncor, Chevron. The large operators, as represented by CAP. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Colleagues, we also heard from NOIA, which is the offshore, which is the oil and gas industry association based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, but really with uh, with membership across Canada. It's the largest oil and gas uh, industry association in Canada. Uh, we also heard from Unifor, uh, the union that represents many of the offshore workers. Uh, we heard from uh, individual companies that uh, that deal in safety uh, on a daily basis. Um, and we heard from Cougar Helicopters, who had a, 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 an excellent presentation, letting us know what the importance of permanent regulations are to the to the helicopter transport um, uh, sector of the uh, of the offshore business. We know, colleagues, that it can be done in less than uh, less than a year, and and we say why, uh, because the officials and the minister told us it could. Uh, the minister specifically said uh, at our uh, at our February 9th committee meeting that they had, and I'm reading from the reading from the the. the the, the document, the text from the document from the committee meeting last week, uh, he said, and I quote, we were scheduled to have a full day in person drafting session the week of March 23rd last year to 2020. And then the pandemic hit. So we know that uh, that the department had at least nine months to get this done to December 31st. We now have those nine months plus five weeks, it being mid-December uh, under that time frame. The minister uh, also said that one of the reasons for the delay, uh, aside from COVID, which obviously had uh, an impact on some delay in 2020, uh, but it had no impact on the delays beginning in 2014 uh, up to the beginning of 2020. Um, we know, colleagues, also that uh, the drafting is complete. Um, Mr. Gardner from, uh, from the department, I'm quoting from his testimony at committee last uh, last Tuesday, the February 9th. I can confirm we do have full draft regulations. This is not a first consultation. As the minister and, and another witness, Mr. Hargrove, have pointed out, there have been extensive consultations on policy intent in five different stages between 2016 and 2018. So colleagues, we know that it can be done in the time given. I reference uh, a, a comment made by um, Senator Patterson in committee. 
and he gave a, an excellent quote from Cyril Northcote uh, Parkinson, work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. Uh, I think that's what's happened here. Uh, when I look at uh, the legislation from 2014, we gave five years to get this done. If you give anyone five years to get something done, uh, I find that they don't start looking at getting it done till year four, and I'm afraid that's what happened in this case. Uh, the, the items that could cause further delay, but I am assured won't cause further delay, are the consultation and gazetting process. Uh, we were told by one of the officials that the regulations have been drafted. Uh, the gazetting process, as per the default that was in the 2014 legislation, is 30 days, 30 days for industry to respond to the draft regulations that the department puts out. We know because we heard testimony from both CAP, from uh, Dr. Ledez, uh, from, from, from NOIA, from Unifor, uh, that they can turn that, uh, they can turn around their comments within the 30 day gazetting requirement. The only thing that requires the only thing that requires greater uh, consultation in gazetting is a 75-day period for international trade agreements and if there is another order from the president of treasury board so the default is 30 days and all parties have accepted that this is what it will take colleagues this is routine this draft is complete and the officials told us so um, Minister O'Regan said uh, the time delay, as I mentioned earlier, was due to consensus decision making. Uh, he said it was because of Canadian federalism. This is not about Canadian federalism. This is about safety in the workplace. This is an easy one. Uh, I recall Senator Simon's uh, comments in committee about perfect being the enemy of good. Senator Simons would know as a, as a, as a journalist and a writer uh, that you can tweak uh, forever to try to make it perfect. Uh, but getting it out the door is, is critical. The other thing, colleagues, with, these, with, the, with this legislation and the regulations that came under the 2014 uh, bill, we don't write the regulations, we give the enabling legislation. Regulations can be changed at any time in the future with a gazetting process and consultations. So uh, that's an important consideration to make. So this is not the end point. This is only the beginning point. Um, I'd like to spend a moment talking about the observations that we made at committee. The key amendment, and there was only, there were three amendments, but it was all encompassing under one amendment, and that's to reduce the timeline to get this done from two years to one year, or in fact, increasing the timeline for the transitional regulations that were put in place by an additional year, six years to seven years, which would end at the end of this current year, December 31st. Uh, 2021. Colleagues, I'd like to talk about the observations made, and I want to thank especially uh, Senators McCallum and Senator Galvez uh, for assisting me on, uh, on, on putting these observations together. They were important. We were tasked to do it, tasked to do it, and presented to steering, which we did. The first observation, colleagues, the committee is concerned that deferring adoption of permanent offshore health and safety regulate regulations is delaying necessary changes. The committee is of the opinion Bill S3 should represent the final extension of the deadline to adopt permanent health and safety regulations for Canada's offshore. Further, the Department of Natural Resources must submit an implementation progress report to the Senate by June 15th, 2021, including the implementation schedule to the expiry of the transitional regulations. Colleagues, this observation is, this observation is obvious. The intent is to ensure that there's oversight in the work that needs to proceed. We can do that through the Energy, Environment and Natural Resources Committee, or we can do it through the Senate itself. Colleagues, observation number two, which was spearheaded by Senator McCollum, and I appreciate her efforts on this. The committee is of the opinion that the regulations should ensure safeguards and best practices are upheld and maintained by all subject to the regulations with regard to the health and safety, regardless of one's age, race, religion, gender, sexuality, etc. Colleagues, I think the observations complete very well the work of the, the work that the committee has done and if this passes third reading as amended as the committee had uh, had recommended we'll all be keenly watching if the other place agrees 
that this should get done as soon as possible. Colleagues, I mentioned some of the presentations that were made at committee, and I do want to finish with this. Uh, we were sent, uh, committee members were sent the day after our February 9th committee meeting and the day before our February 11th committee meeting of last week, uh, a submission by Robert Decker in French and in English. Uh, Robert Decker, you'll recall from my second reading speech, was the lone survivor of Cougar Flight 491, which went down in the Atlantic Ocean in March 2009. And I want to read one line from Mr. Decker's, uh, Mr. Decker's submission. And, and as you'll recall, I know Mr. Decker, uh, and he does not speak publicly about this, but he was driven to uh, at, this, uh, at this juncture. And I'll just read one, one section from his, uh, from his submission. I would like to add my voice as a victim of the failure of safety in the offshore, that five years after the initial 2014 legislation seemed like a long time for something everybody agreed on. The one-year delay granted in 2018 flew under the radar, but was accepted because there appeared to be forward movement. He says, now a further delay in implementing these health and safety regulations to January 2023 gives the strong impression that those charged with the, in, with the legislative oversight of safety in the offshore have not learned and don't care. Senators, I urge you to press the government to do what was promised and to not let the excuses of Ottawa further impact the safety in our workplace. Colleagues, nothing more needs to be said. Let's get this done. Thank you. On the date, uh...